Okay. So, yeah, about 217 species have been recorded on site now in that time. And we're getting towards, you know, there's maybe, if we get half a dozen more birds here, we'll pretty much have exhausted the ones that could or should be here. And some of the birds, like grey crowned babblers, used to be common here back in the early days, but I haven't seen them here now for a number of years. Um, but, so. Okay, I'm going to move on. If anyone's got a question about a particular bird, what you've got up, just stick your hand up and I'll, I'll try and answer it. Yeah. Uh, probably <coughs> loss of habitat with um, a bit more clearing and um, and great crown babblers tend to be long-lived birds, so they'll hang around <coughs> not breeding for, you know, they might live for 20 plus years. So people think the population is fine, and then suddenly it just crashes and they disappear. That may, may have been the case here. So, uh... Okay, I won't worry about playing the brush turkey call, it's not very melodic. Um, I'm currently having a battle with, with one of these in our yard. It's got a giant mound not far from our house, which is actually on council land land. And earlier, uh, middle of last year, we did some fairly major landscaping at the front. And so uh, it's, it's an ongoing battle, but I think I've got him beaten at the moment. So. Okay, a couple of water birds here, the dusky moorhen, the one on the left, and the wandering whistling duck. We've got two species of whistling ducks in this area. Uh, the plumed whistling duck, which is far the most common, um, you know, often get them around the, the, the water, um, the lakes over near the, on the way to the um, other campground over there. And Cove Road, which goes off where Woodrow Road comes off, goes the other way. There's a lot of farm dams and some quite big ones down along there, and there's usually quite a lot of them there. These guys are got a lot more colour in them and the, don't have the prominent plumes up on the wings like the uh, like the plume whistling duck. So a couple more ducks here. The one on the left. Heart is it called a hardhead? It used to be called a white-eyed duck, and that indicates by the white eye that that's a male. But after the the bird sex police or well, gender police got involved, they said no, it's being gender specific, so you have to just call it hardhead. I'm not quite sure where that name came from. I probably have read it in the past. The other one is a very cute little duck with these like leathery flaps on the side of the bill and they, they go around um, sort of siphoning water through it and getting nutrients out and that's called a, a pink ear duck and you can actually see the little pink ear there a little bit. Um, mm. They probably, it's not always easy to see, they may be zebra duck or something might have been a more appropriate name. Buff banded rail, one of the furtive birds, so they get very unfurtive in areas like coastal islands or um, the ginger factory, and they're the ones that pop up on the table and steal your chips. Uh, pretty common around waterways throughout southeast Queensland and identified by a prominent buff band across the breast and the, the white eyebrow and the striping. There is another crepe or rail very similar to it called Lewin's Rail. It's got a more prominent beak and doesn't have the, the um, buff on the breast or the eyebrow like that. Okay, tawny frogmouths. Very, very common. Uh, there's probably two or three pairs on site here. Um, at the last festival, we were seeing them on the butterfly walk coming up from 
main entrance, walking up into the festival entrance. There was a pair there with a couple of young, and they're often up or up the other way in the um, OP area. Some years ago, there was a a reality TV show being played out on site with a house with no wall in it and it was a family called the Cleavers and um, they probably came down from the hills somewhere well west of here but sitting right above the roof of the second story on a branch for the whole festival were these pair of tawny frogmouths that people never ever saw them they were too busy seeing what the Cleavers were up to. What sort of call were they like? Uh, oh sorry yeah I should play that shouldn't I? It's quite a distinctive call. Yeah, you'll often hear it at night. So they have um they can have one to three young. Sometimes I back once I actually saw four that they don't usually get four or three, but I've seen them with three. Okay, the southern blue book, very distinctive call also. That's a small owl, one of the hawk owls as we call them, about that big. And quite common still around um, urban areas, if, if you've got some woodland, big trees. A few months ago we were up at Cania Gorge and there was about five of them used to call every night there in the campground, which was quite amazing. Again, a very distinctive call. Oh, sorry, I'll try the other one. <laughs> they used to be called Mopo Gals because the call is a bit like that. Okay, here's the big thing. The big one of the owls in Australia, uh, the powerful owl, and uh, it's has been recorded on site a few times. Um, they like um, they have quite quite a big area. One of their main foods are things like uh, possums or, or greater gliders, um, fruit bats, um, and it's got a. Of all the Australian owls, it's probably got the most owl-like book. Uh, there is a, a, a <coughs> program being I'm looking at the powerful owls. In Australia, and um, Rob, um, Rob Clemens. Clemens gave a talk at the well, oh, oh, bush time. Yeah, the bush time trial. In, so you'll often see them sitting there in the daytime with half a possum hanging in their claw. They don't bother eating it during the day, but they obviously have it as a snack before they go out at night. Okay, I'm sure you all know the rainbow lorikeet, very common. Other lorikeets we've got on site here are the scaly breasted lorikeet, smaller one with yellow scalloping on the breast. Uh, I'm not even have a slide of it. And the little lorikeet, which is about that big. You can see there, red, red face patch. And uh, that's lights making that color. It's got that really, the lorikeet calls go from the rainbow, which is quite a harsh call, down through the um, musk lorikeet, scaly breasted, down to the little. And the little, you usually get their call when they're flying. They remind me of little jet fighter planes. They, you, know, you hear the call and you look up and they're, they're, they're sort of almost ahead of it. But a very They tend to move around quite a bit following flowering uh, native trees, particularly eucalypts. So their population uh, has 
declined fairly dramatically with the widespread clearing of eucalypt woodland around uh, South East Queensland. Okay, the glossy black cockatoo. They uh, have been recorded on site here several times, but in the general area from probably Dabra, south from Dabra, or from Sanford up through Dabra, up to um, around Mullaney. They, and they, in this area, they feed on one of the Cacharina, Ala Cacharina um, cones. So that's a female. They have this this mottled yellow on the head. Some of them have almost completely yellow heads, others have a little bit. Whereas the male has a, a browny black head. So they're, they're considered to be uh, endangered. I'm sure you all know this guy. Fairly, fairly common around the area. The little Corellas. We never used to see them in southeast Queensland until probably 20 or 30 years ago. Now they're, you know, I've seen them in blocks of maybe a couple of thousand. They uh, like to get down on the ground and, and dig, dig for seeds. There's a close relative of theirs which was only found down um, in southern Australia, the long bill Corella. And they have a pink patch across the breast and uh, the upper mandible is quite quite long. That's the top top part of the bill. And they're considerably larger than the, the little corella. Galar, I'm sure you all know the galar. Again, it's one of those birds which were not found in southeast Queensland, but they uh, with clearing of the coastal rainforests and eucalypt forests they, uh, and planting of seeding grasses and things like that. They're now also very common in southeast Queensland. Which tail eagle? Uh, maybe we won't see them during this Thing because of the weather, but there's a pair that have been around here for years, and you'll usually see them soaring around up, up in the valley up here, above the valley or up on the ridge, and getting um, up grass the wind. Uh, I think it was during the last festival there was an adult pair with a juvenile with them that we often saw flying around. So uh, they were most prominent here some years ago when there was a dead cow down on the property next door and there was a, a gathering of raptors there it reminded me of in Spain when the vultures come into dead beasts and they leave them out but there was several wedge-tailed eagles there were whistling kites and um, black kites all in there uh, trying to get their, their fill so. okay great gossip these guys often nest down along Cove Road just after you cross the Stanley River. On the left, there's some tall eucalypts with quite dense understory, and I've seen them nesting there a number of times in the last few years, and see them on site reasonably frequently. There's two different colour morphs of this. One of them is completely white, and this one is, is grey, but they, um, they're not considered separate species, separate subspecies, they're in, they're just different. What we could call different colour morphs. So. Ah, Pacific Baza or Crested Hawk as it used to be called. These are a fairly common bird. And they feed mainly on phasnids, which are praying mantis and those types of things. And in the big giant phasmids that you get in eucalypts and that and you'll see them they'll fly against foliage and actually beat it with their wings trying to stir these things out. They'll also eat frogs and um, I have seen them taking fruit. When I, I did some great postgraduate study in ornithology I did a project on these guys and I found a pair nesting in our local park which was 
quite interesting. I used to go down and uh, sit there in my little chair with my little tape recorder and record. And as the adult birds came back with food, I'd be looking around and I couldn't see them anywhere. But the, mate, the, the two juveniles would just start calling and they'd build up to a crescendo as the adult birds landed to feed them. So. Longer pigeon. This is one of quite a few different um, pigeons on site. These you tend to hear them more than see them here, but up in when you go up the, uh, the valley up past where the Grand normally is there, you'll hear that the call, which is um, and that will go on and on at times. So. So, so teen bird watchers tend to call that the walk, 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 call. Uh, the long poo. This is what's called the long poo pigeon. Beautiful big fruit dove about that size. And you'll often hear them calling, but they're very difficult to spot because they're usually up in the canopy feeding on fruits up there. Um, so I like their scientific name. Villantopus magnificus. Okay, this is the digiwalk bird, digiwalk pigeon. Brown. Around Cookie Dog, as it's called. Did you walk? Did you walk? And they, they're fruit eaters. You can see that one's eating the, one of the uh, deadly nightshade species, the wild tobacco. And they, it's amazing the number of those they can get down in, in one sitting. So they're one of the. Uh, Things that help, help spread wild tobacco around the place. Crested pigeon. I used to be taught top knots when I was young, but there is another top knot pigeon. So these are now called crested pigeons. Uh, John Gould, the English ornithologist back in the 1860s, described it as one of the most beautiful little pigeons I've come across. He said, the sad thing is that most people will never get to see it because it is only found in the arid inland of the colony. But now they are very, very common in, in, uh, in most areas where there's been clearing of trees, a bit like the galahs, they, uh, they feed on seed on the ground. You'll often see them where there's fig trees and there's been um, flying foxes and fig birds feeding. They swallow the, the, the fig and then pass the seeds through themselves through very quickly. So the whole ground underneath is covered in, in these seeds. And you'll often see these guys and some of the parrots there feeding on the seeds on the ground. That's very good recycling you now. They're using it quite. Regent bowerbird, see here occasionally. Um, again, um, spectacular male there. Not, not, not as exciting call. Um, it took them a long time to actually, the early ornithologists thought these were some sort of honey eater. Mm. And then eventually someone found a bower. Um, I've only ever seen one bower, I think, in, in, you know, in 40 years of fairly solid bird watching. So. Uh, male satin bower bird. Um, Often see the female or juvenile males on site here, and they're very different. They, they're a, um, the only thing that's the same is the beautiful lilac eye. Uh, they're a olivey green on the back with some um, sort of um, scalloping down the front. And but these guys have an amazing call. Mm 
Does that one do the dance? They just make yeah, the can, yeah, dance, right? So they're interesting birds. The both the um, satin bowbird and the regent bowbird. The take seven years to reach, reach maturity. So in that period between when they hatch, they look like a female. Their, their plumage is the same. You can start telling the males of these guys when they're about four years old because their bill starts turning white, whereas the females have got a dark bill. Um, the birds that I see here on the site tend to be either juvenile males or, uh, or females. Occasionally you'll see a male, but I don't think I've ever seen a bower on the site. Okay, the pheasant kugel, which is a cuckoo, but non-parasitic, and um, that's breeding plumage, non-breeding there uh, plain buffy colour down the front of the head and again a quite a distinctive call. What? Do they hatch <laughs> like with one body and two wings and two heads? No, no, that's that's two different chicks there. <laughs> sitting side by side. <laughs> And that red there is their, when they open their mouth, when the parent comes back, hoping they say, stuff what food you've got down my mouth, please, quickly. So. <laughs> okay, this bird's quite common on site this time of year. And it's called a channel bill cuckoo, or well, the one on the left is, which is a juvenile. And the one on the right is its host ferret, the um, uh, Teresian crow, the common, which is the only crow in this area. And I think it's about to get a bit of um, Kentucky Fried Chicken or something stuck down its throat. <laughs> which is interesting because as adult birds, they feed mainly on, uh, on fruit. But, um, so the poor old crows, and they're the only, only cuckoos that will put more than one egg in a nest. Occasionally, I've seen two, but once I saw three channel bill chicks from this poor pair of crows trying to keep the food up to them. And then they started, you know, they start following them around. So, so I better play the call for that because you'll be hearing, I heard it a bit earlier. Yeah. When they fly, they're quite, you know, from the head to tail, they're at the end of the tail about that long. And the wings seem to be up close to the front of the bird, and they often get called the flying cross. They look like a. So, this is the coel, which has been, I've heard, called several times. Uh, that's the one that flew through the venue on me. So you'll hear this at all times of the night. <laughs> now that was the female answering there, that little part of it. Um, so that's a female coming up now. She's quite different as you can see, in, in, um, and they do sort of they'll call together at times. So. Do they sleep in summer? They what? Do they sleep in summer? They seem to go 24 hours a day. Uh, well, no, I, I guess they have a little rest during the day, but they're more active at night, certainly. Um, just build a couple more cuckoos, and then fantail cuckoo again is pretty common on site. So the corral is a cuckoo as well. Sorry? The corral is a cuckoo. The coel. Yes. Okay. Yep. So this fantail cuckoo has got quite a voluminous call. You know, sometimes the bird will be you know, 30 or 40 metres away and you're hearing it quite loudly, so they really project their call. These cuckoos are all brood parasites. And the so the next one, the brush cuckoo, 
Again, very common and it's a call you'll hear quite frequently. How am I going, Sandra? Okay. Okay. I don't have my time on my phone. Hmm? I don't know. What's the time on your? It's 10 to 10. So we've got time. Okay. Big bird, one of the more common birds on site. And as their name implies, they feed on figs, but they also eat quite a lot of other fruit. That's a male, that red eye patch, um, olive green back. The female is quite different. She's a light olive on the back with streaking down the front. Um, when I was up here late last year, uh, the weather was a bit like this actually, but in the afternoon I was just up in the valley there and there was I counted about 60 big birds coming through just before dusk. And they were landing in one of the big pine trees just up here, stopping for and they were heading somewhere up there to roost for the night. Mm -hmm. They belong to the Oriole family. And this bird is an olive-backed Oriole. Again, the female fig bird is similar to that, so it doesn't have the orange coloured bill, and it's a bit bigger and, and less prominent streaking. These guys tend to disappear a bit during the, uh, the winter months, but come back to breed in southeast Queensland and very distinctive form. Golden Whistler. So the females again are quite different. This is the male. Female is this buffy light colour and just a little bit of that yellow wash down around the, the bent area. And um, fairly prominent dark eye at just a uniformly buff coloured little bird. Blue faced honey eater. The juveniles of these birds have a greeny yellow face patch which they retain until they reach adulthood after they're about 15 months old. So if you see one of these with a yellowy face, it's just an a immature bird. Again, fairly common. Little fryer bird. Two species of fry birds here, the noisy fry bird, which is the one with the um, quite bald head with a big bump on its bill. And uh, this one's a little, it's got big distinctive call also. So they're about that long, whereas a noisy fry bird about that long, it's got sort of a big bib on the front of it too. Don't think I've got one in there. Too. Yellow faced honey eater. Again, one of the more common birds here, particularly during winter. They migrate from down south in big numbers in during the winter months. A few years ago, one of the early morning walks during the festival, there was a lot of native trees flowering down around the office area, and we recorded 13 species of honey eaters there in about half an hour. It was quite amazing. They're the biggest um, family of birds in, in um, Australia. 
This one, again, a distinctive call and quite common, it's a chord. Repeated note. That distinctive, that, that, that this slide's a bit dark. They're more, more um, olive green than that, but this looks a lot darker with the light on it. Um, the Scarlet Honeyeater. Now, these, the last couple of years have been really a lot more than I've ever seen around. In fact, on, I was up here at the site for the planting last year, I think it was. And they were, you know, every tree that was flowering had scarlet honeyeaters in it. Um, that's a male. Female is, has, um, is a, again, a puppy brown colour with just a little bit of pink wash. And uh, again, they've got quite a, quite a distinctive call. Eastern Whipbird, I'm sure you've all heard that call. And the male, <laughs> male and female, actually, the male does the long drawn out whip, whip call, and the female does the sort of <laughs> the end. So, so that at the end is the female answering. And if you listen carefully when you when you hear them, you'll hear that. You know, one call is coming from there and the other one will be from the other side of the path that way. But quite distinctive with that. This is an adult bird, obviously, but with that white throat and the little little black crest. Now, this, these are interesting birds. Um, Spangled drongo. <laughs> We have one species in continental Australia, the Spangled Drongo, but up in Southeast Asia there's quite a few, including the, the lesser racket-tailed Drongo and the great racket-tailed Drongo. And these guys have tails, it almost looks like a, a squash racket or something sort of hanging on the plumes at the bottom of their tail. These guys are very good mimics. Um, they tend to be altitudinal migrants in this area. That's the typical call, but they often imitate other, other birds you know, in the area too. And they tend to catch insects on the wing. They'll fly out and catch something and go back to a fruit. They will also eat small birds. I once took a group out to bird watching and uh, one of the ladies there wanted to see a red backed fairy wren and so I knew a place where we would, would see them and so we're standing there and the male landed up on the post and, it, and she was oh that's lovely it's wonderful next to this fangled rongo came down and there were a few red feathers and that sort of hanging out the beak and up up here at one festival there was um, some sugar gliders, pygmy gliders in, in one of the nesting boxes and the frongos were trying to pull, you know, pull the, the little ones out from there. They were. Bollard, it's a, a migrant down from Southeast Asia during our, our summer, escaping the, the northern winter. And they, they're a hollow nester and they feed on, on flying insects. So I um, often see them on site here during the summer, particularly in some of the big old eucalypts that are around with hollows in. Uh, again, a, quite a distinctive call.
Ja, oh. <laughs> yes, that's how they became known as dollar birds. They, when the early European settlers came here, uh, particularly ones that had been at the gold rushes in um, in America, they they. Well, I've got just add a little bit more. The colony of New South Wales ran short on coins in about the, I think the 1920s or uh, 1820s or something like that. And it was going to take six months to a year to get more coins out from, from, from England. So, as a short term measure, they bought in these Spanish silver dollars. And um, so they, they bought all those. Silvery white patches on their wings, which you see when they fly, look like um, dollars. So that's how they became known as dollar birds. Is that, is that the whistle? What's that? Is it the whistle? Someone else's call? Is it? Yeah, it's not not the dollar bird, sorry, I missed. The eater. These guys are interesting. They they nest in burrow they dig a burrow into into the sandy loamy soil which can be up to a metre long, a nesting chamber there. You can see the, the tail streamer on that there. And males and females both have them, but the males tends to be about twice as long as the females. And when they've been nesting for a while, you know, that, that becomes very bent and worn, and sometimes it'll be gone off the adult bird as they uh, feed the young down in the, um, in the, the hollow. So if you see a bird just suddenly disappear in front of you, and you think, where did that go? Um, but it looks like that. It'll be a bee heading into its burrow. Uh, again, a distinctive call. They tend to migrate north in big flocks um, up, up into um, Papua New Guinea and um, come back down at the old. I've been up north at times and seen flocks of maybe three or four hundred heading there. But having said that, there's always a few of them around during winter. But we don't know whether the young birds overwintering or what, there's not enough study being done on them. Sacred kingfisher, uh, one of a number. Well, the two main ones we see on site are the sacred and the um, forest, but also around the larger ponds there's azure kingfishers. In fact, I've even had them fly through what the venue formerly known as the duck, which is called the yoga, whatever here now at the moment. And yeah, they one and they do this little call uh, as they fly. I'm lucky enough to have them right behind us in, um, nesting in the creek bank and feeding along the creek but hopefully while I'm up here we won't have the creek visiting us which it does occasionally so uh, these guys nest in arboreal termite mounds so that's those mud termite mounds you see up in the tree and you'll see a hole about that size punched through the side of it and the Forest kingfisher also nests in those, and kookaburras will also. The kookaburra hole will be back up around. So, kookaburras are the world's largest kingfisher. So these guys tend to be summer migrants. They come, they head north during the winter, but there's always a few around, particularly in coastal areas. You'll see them feeding on soldier crabs and other stuff along the coast. So that's a very distinctive little call. Bush stone curlews. There's been a 
pair, resident pair here for quite a few years. And when you go down past Lake Gula, on the right hand side, they're usually up in that, where that bank goes up uh, in the fairly dense um, vegetation with, with a lot of leaf litter and that underneath. So they have a quite amazing call too. Rufus fantail, which is uh, closely related to the willy wagtail and the grey fantail, it tends to be more of a summer migrant passing through. They're interesting, they turn up behind our place in Brisbane and they'll arrive during the night from somewhere, they'll spend the day feeding and the next morning they're, they're gone. So they obviously migrate at night and then spend the day refueling wherever they get to. Um, there's some do stay around all year. Again, not enough studies being done on them to know why that is. But, um, fairly similar call to the grey fantail. Eastern yellow robin, uh, fairly common on site, particularly in the slightly more um, vegetated areas, um, up the valley in the rainforest areas there, and then just even along the creek up here. Uh, they have several calls, and they're one of the first birds that starts calling in the dawn chorus. So that's the more common, that little chook chook is the one you'll hear often in the rainforest. It's often the first call you'll hear. And then that other... Um, the rose robin. Interesting little bird. Um, male with a feeding a chick there. They in the summer months, they're in the upland rainforest where they nest, and you'll often hear them calling, uh, but very hard to see when you know, it's a bird that long, and um, it's up in the top of these. The female is it's all grey with just a little bit of a pinkish wash on the front. A lot of much lighter grey, and all these females of these these robins have got various markings on their wings, and that's one of the easiest ways to distinguish them. Some of them do have a bit of colour. So these guys, in the winter months, come down, and we get them on site here um, during the winter months, and they head down to coastal um, areas, woodland areas. So. The red browed finch, most common finch on site, well, sorry, sometimes. But we also get the chestnut breasted mannequin, which if they get good season, they'll breed. Last year, I was seeing flocks of you know, maybe 100 plus chestnut breasted mannequins on site, and half of them were juveniles, so they obviously had a, had a fairly good breeding season. To find them, we come up, if you come around the road that comes around this way from down where the office and all the buildings are, there's been a lot of bunya pines and hoop pines planted up either side of the road and they love nesting in the, in the ends of the branches there in amongst all the big prickly leaves. It um, tends to stop predators, particularly snakes that might like to crawl out and try and you know, 
because the branches of the bunion have got these little sharp thorns all along, little sharp spikes. It's a little the peaceful dove crawling in the background there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I don't have a chestnut breast to manage them, but So I had this black throated finch here when the um, um, for one talk I gave. Uh, and it was causing all the problems with Adani. So you can see that the brown, that's the southern subspecies of it, where the only place where it's found now, and that's all part of those mining leases up there. So, Okay, just the people whose slides are in here. And... Uh, Okay, if anyone's got any questions, we've got a few more still Sandra. What's the time now? Uh, 10 past 10. Okay, so Andrew's doing a talk at 10.30, so maybe five minutes. Five minutes. Right. Any questions about just birds generally? Or? What's your feeling with the Indian uh, minor bird? Uh, <coughs> we'll never get rid of them completely. They're too well established. And uh, once the birds, birds like that become naturalized almost they tend to initially they tend to build up uh, in fairly big numbers and then the population will, will balance out to what is sustainable for them but it's, <clears throat> the worst part about them is that they are hollow nesters and something like 22 percent of our australian native birds are hollow nesters and they like to be able to look out of the hollow when they, they're in there. So they fill the, you know, and you get owls and some of the uh, parrots and things nesting down, well down a big <coughs> hollow. So they fill it up with junk. And these days it's all human junk, like bits of plastic and rubbish and bits of twine. And, and the other thing is, all birds tend to have their own ectoparasites, basically. Lice, and if they they leave in infestations of them in those hollows when they use them, and if the native species try to use it afterwards, they'll these um, lice tend to there's no they haven't reached a balance with the birds like you know, human lice, which are not very common these days. You know, back until the mid 1800s, and um, pretty much all people had had lice. Um, and that they weren't bird lice, but yeah, so that's that's one of the big problems with them. They're going to affect our, our hollow nesting birds. Um, interestingly, they were brought to Australia uh, initially down in southern Australia in the market gardens, so they would eat the pests that were eating the young plants. But then, uh, not only did they eat the um, some pests, but they started eating the plants too, and they just spread from there. And then they were introduced in the cane areas in Queensland to eat cane beetles. And like the cane toads, I don't think between them they probably haven't eaten you know, very many cane beetles at all. And uh, so they've, they've become both um, environmental disasters. But unfortunately, they're here to stay. They can in, in some areas. I just they will. Um, they when they're not breeding, they they communally nest, and so they'll, you'll get a tree somewhere, and there'll be you know, maybe four or five hundred birds in there. And I know in New South Wales they were um, um, firing these cannon nets over the tree, and then pulling over big plastic sheet and gassing them, and they're getting rid of quite a significant um, a number of the local populations doing that and but it would take them a few years to build it up back to where they were again but, um, those things tend to be uh, a bit politically uh, um, 
debatable um, because you know you get people who think you shouldn't kill any birds because they know that you know, an enormous pest or cull them or whatever. So, okay, one more question. Um, I remember finding them out just probably a few months ago. You were talking about the bowel birds. Yep. There was a lot of male ones. It looked like a lot of female, a young female. Or you were saying it wasn't like four or five years until they started to change. Yeah, about four years they'll start, the bill on them will, it will start going light colour. Okay. And then between four and seven, when they get towards seven, you'll suddenly start seeing these black, blotchy feathers coming through and they, they look very untidy for a few months. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for being so patient early on. Thank you, Roy. And uh, I'll be hanging around for a little while this morning, so I'll get a report from home to see whether we're going to have water views or not. And, um, All right, thanks, Roy. Thank you.